Um, just want to thank everybody, first of all, for uh, coming out here in the cold. Um, I uh, um, know people have come from all over. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, and also thank you to Donna for uh, organizing this whole event. Uh, I'm really flattered to, to be up here speaking to you all today. Um, so my, the title of my talk is A Cast from the Past. And I'm going to be talking about uh, the history of clubfoot management and um, specifically regarding the Ponsetti method, which was developed here at Iowa. And I'll be util or using diffusion of innovation theory to kind of uh, um, provide the context for the Ponsetti method and its dissemination throughout the world. So uh, I think the place to start is to introduce you all to uh, what clubfoot is. It is, um, as you can see here, this child was born with clubfoot. And it's a very characteristic uh, inward turning of the feet. And um, it's, in fact, the most common musculoskeletal birth defect. One in 800 kids uh, have uh, or are born with club foot. And uh, that equates to about 200,000 people a year, or about one every three minutes, or one person since I even started talking. Um, and 80% of, uh, of club foot cases are actually found uh, in the developing world. And that's uh, important because in the developing world, uh, club foot has a huge burden on society. Um, children uh, are often killed or abandoned in some of these countries. There's a, uh, a belief in some places that if a child is born with club foot, that they actually um, are being cursed by the gods, and, and these children are abandoned for that reason. Um, if, they're, if they manage to make it through that, there's very often a social stigma associated with having club foot. These children have a harder time uh, achieving uh, education. They can't contribute to their household workforce. And uh, they end up becoming a burden on their household and ultimately society. They're unable to provide their own income. And they oftentimes have to have a caregiver who helps them get around. And so um, really, in my opinion, uh, um, helping uh, prevent untreated clubfoot is really something that we can do in terms of uh, uh, getting rid of poverty in the developing world because of it, the enormous economic consequences. Not to mention that clubfoot's debilitatingly painful. Now, as this is a history of medicine society talk, I figured I'd start out with uh, some history about clubfoot. Uh, clubfoot was first uh, documented in ancient Egypt, actually. Um, and this is a picture of Roma, who's a doorkeeper um, to the 18th or 19th dynasty. And what you'll see here is he has a uh, um, uh, club foot, and he also has polio. This was documented in 1500 BC. And um, I find this image really important because both club foot and polio have a lot of similarities. They're both very uh, debilitating physical diseases. And nowadays, we don't really hear of polio anymore. Um, as a medical student, I've never seen a case of it. And uh, that's because there's a vaccine that was developed that everybody takes. That's basically a series of, uh, initially it was a series of shots, three shots that people would take that would prevent them from, uh, from ever having developing the physical uh, disability associated with polio. And I think that the series of uh, interventions that prevent polio from being a physical disability are also uh, very similar to the series of interventions that will prevent uh, untreated clubfoot from being uh, uh, such a physical disability, as you'll soon see uh, by the end of this talk. So um, the most famous early depiction of clubfoot was uh, uh, actually one of the most famous pharaohs in Egypt. And this was only recently found out, actually, in uh, 2010 by uh, uh, Hawass, who published this article in JAMA. Um, so King Tut who uh, ruled from, or actually was born in 1341 BC, and he lived till 1323 BC. Uh, it was, uh, uh, he only lived for 19 years. And um, although the cause of his death is, um, is unknown, it's uh, believed that Clubfoot might have had um, some, uh, might have played a small role in uh, how he died. Um, and so what happened was in 2007 to 2009, um, Dr. Hawass and his team uh, conducted the King Tutankhamun uh, Family Project, which was a really meticulous series of anthropological, radiographic, and molecular genetic studies. And what they did, this is an image of uh, the mummified King Tut. 
And uh, this next image is a CT scan that they took of his foot. And um, what you'll see here is uh, uh, this, uh, the foot is actually supine and inwardly rotated on his left foot, which is uh, evidence that he did, in fact, have club foot. Now, the next evidence of club foot, or actually the management of club foot, comes from the father of Western medicine himself. So Hippocrates, you may have heard of him, uh, lived from 460 BC to 377 BC. And um, this is a, a book that's a direct translation from the work, his work in, in Greek, and it translates it into English. And he has a chapter on uh, the, uh, what's, what he calls articulations. And he speaks extensively here about the management of clubfoot. And this is documented by Adams in 1891. But uh, there are some core principles in clubfoot that are really important to understand uh, from Hippocrates' work. That is that early treatment is paramount to the success of uh, clubfoot management. Um, the second principle is that um, you should overcorrect the club foot using serial manipulations, and Hippocrates used bandages. Um, and three is to follow that protocol by bracing. So I want you all to remember these three principles that were developed 2,400 years ago, or first described 2,400 years ago by Hippocrates. And then you'll start to understand the title of my talk, which is a cast from the past. Um, so then, unfortunately, unlike the rest of Hippocrates' work, which is kind of immortalized in medicine, um, his writings on clubfoot didn't withstand the test of time, and soon they were forgotten. In the Middle Ages, actually, there's not much do documentation about the management of clubfoot, but um, what we do know is that it was mainly conducted by barbers, charlatans, and bone setters. Now, the next uh, important documentation of clubfoot comes from Archaeus, who actually used uh, um, Hippocrates uh, as the motivation for his, his work. So he's a Spanish surgeon who in uh, 1653 wrote a book chapter on clubfoot. And he describes uh, his treatment, which is uh, repeated stretching and this apparatus that he used to reduce the deformity, and then this small boot that he had his patients wear afterwards. Um, the next documentation of clubfoot comes from Scarpa, who is an Italian surgeon. And in 1803, he um, actually utilized this device, which is he uses forceful manipulation. This is actually an amazing picture because this is, comes from the Hunterian Museum in London. Um, and uh, he basically would tighten the belts, and that would be how he would uh, achieve correction of the foot. Um, Next was Dr. Timothy Sheldrake, who in 1816, he was an English surgeon. And what he did was he documented uh, um, the utilization of bandages in order to treat uh, clubfoot. And that was very similar to what Hippocrates had described, actually. And so he wrote an essay on clubfoot. And these are just some images that I took from his essay, or from his book, rather, um, about clubfoot. And next is an important uh, aspect of clubfoot, which is the tenotomy. Um, the tenotomy refers to clipping of the Achilles heel. Um, it just clipped completely through, and then the Achilles tends to grow back. And this was first described by Delpech in uh, 1823. He introduced the first subcutaneous tenotomy. And um, although he did several of them, he ended up having to stop them because there was a very high postoperative infection rate, and he was doing more harm than he was good for these patients. However, his, uh, this idea of the tenotomy continued, and Dr. Louis Strohmeyer, um, in 1831, uh, continued practicing the tenotomy, and he taught it to his apprentice, W.J. Little. And W.J. Little used uh, what he learned, and he has been said to have perfected the tenotomy. He published uh, his dissertation on the, club, the tenotomy um, to, as a part of the clubfoot treatment uh, in 1873. Um, next is uh, the next milestone in clubfoot treatment it comes from Dr. Uh, Jules René Guerin, uh, who in 1838 uh, actually introduced plaster of Paris, which is what is utilized in regular casting in order to treat clubfoot. And although plaster of Paris has been used previously, 
uh, for other orthopedic corrections. It really hadn't been used for clubfoot until Dr. Guerin introduced it uh, in 1838. Now, um, the next major milestone comes from Dr. Uh, Hiram Kite, who is a John Hopkins surgeon in 1939. He published um, one of the landmark articles in uh, the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery that emphasized problems associated with the forceful manipulation uh, techniques and also surgical procedures. And um, he actually created his own non-surgical technique to treat clubfoot, which was uh, uh, which gained popularity uh, since 1939, until um, each of these individuals uh, started working on, or actually, uh, sur until surgery became the most uh, favored method for clubfoot. Now, since uh, during this time, uh, anesthesia techniques and uh, post-operative uh, um, infections were going down, and so it was perceived that surgery was where all of the m major um, innovations were coming from in terms of, uh, um, of how to correct deformity. And so each of these individuals actually published their own surgical manipulation on how to treat club foot. And um, so all of these gentlemen, plus these gentlemen who are not pictured, um, had to develop their own surgical corrections for club foot. Now, Dr. Arthur Steinler is actually uh, the head of the uh, orthopedics department here at the University of Iowa. And uh, he is one of the reasons that the University of Iowa has had one of the uh, largest influences in the world when it comes to club foot and its management. And that's because he asked uh, a young Spanish surgeon, Dr. Ignacio Ponsetti, uh, to review his surgical correction for club foot. And uh, Dr. Ponsetti reviewed uh, Dr. Steinler's patients and he found that his method left patients with a very stiff gait and, um, or sorry, stiff ankles and a compromised gait. And he found it to be unsatisfactory and he started to develop a procedure uh, of his own. And um, the, he, that method, the Ponsetti method, which he actually, he's, uh, one of the landmark articles came in 1963, um, is now the gold standard method to treat club foot. Um, it's a non-surgical technique, and uh, it's five weeks of plaster of Paris. And what you'll see here is um, uh, it's serial casting. And so the club foot is slightly corrected every week until you achieve an overcorrection. And then in, in between the last week, which will happen usually between week four and five, depending on the severity of the club foot, uh, there's an in-office tenotomy procedure. So usually you just use a little bit of lidocaine, and you can use a very small knife, even a cataract knife, which is one of the smallest surgical knives there is, and um, uh, clip the Achilles tendon completely. And because these children are so young, it grows back into the corrected position. Um, and then these children use a, they, they sleep with a foot abduction brace for four to five years um, after they have their casting, which takes about five weeks. So this is the foot abduction brace. All it does is it holds the feet out like this so then the children don't experience a relapse. And this is one of the most important aspects of not achieving a relapse is the brace. Um, and what Dr. Ponsetti found with this technique is that calcaneal internal rotation or adduction and plantar flexion are the key to the deformity. And that's the main difference between his technique and Dr. Kite's technique. Now, main reason that the Ponsetti method is so successful is because of the quality that, that Dr. Ponsetti was able to achieve in his patients. It's 95% effective. This has been very well documented in the literature. Um, not only is it highly uh, effective, it's also very inexpensive. So it, the average cost is about $250 a patient for the entire um, procedure. And most of that comes from the cost of the actual foot abduction brace. And as um, manufacturing and uh, mass production and uh, our uh, development of the brace continues, that cost can just continues to get driven down uh, lower and lower. And so um, it's especially important because untreated club foot at about 30 years has been compared to uh, the same quality of life that of people who have advanced stage Parkinson's disease and 
advanced uh, chronic uh, heart failure. Before I go on, I just want to ask you if you can remember the three principles of, uh, that Hippocrates described 2,400 years ago, and if they remind you of any of the principles in Dr. Ponsetti's uh, uh, method here. So his, his, uh, what he said was, early treatment is paramount to success, and you start the uh, procedure right away. That serial uh, corrections, and uh, he used bandages, P Dr. Ponsetti used casting uh, to achieve an overcorrection um, is key, and also that uh, bracing needs to occur after the correction is achieved. And so um, I just find that very interesting. Um, however, despite uh, the high quality and low cost of Dr. Ponsetti's technique, he experienced a very delayed dissemination of his technique. He published it in 1963. However, it didn't really take off within the orthopedic community until the early 2000s. And um, what you'll see here, this, these are the number of patients that were seen in the University of Iowa's clinic uh, from 1995 until 2001. You'll see a dramatic increase around 2000 and 2001. And uh, that slide actually shows the number of hits to the virtual hospital web page. So the University of Iowa developed a web page that talked about Dr. Ponsetti's techniques. And you see that during that same time period, um, the number of hits directly increased as well. And uh, the reason that is, is because it's actually been fairly well documented in this study by uh, Dr. Marquende in 2003, is because of these Yahoo-based internet support groups of parents who are speaking about this Dr. Ponsetti, who is practicing out of the University of Iowa, treating these kids non-surgically, and their kids were doing uh, fabulous. They were running around and having no problems, and everybody else in the United States and the rest of the world was having surgery, and their kids were having all sorts of trouble. Stiff ankles, they were having trouble getting around, they were experiencing relapses, and uh, because of that, um, the number of hits, that they basically funneled everybody to the University of Iowa website. The website experienced a lot more hits, and then the number of patients came from all over the world. And during this time period as well, this graph relates to the number of clubfoot diagnoses that ended up resulting in surgery. And you'll see that uh, early on, about 80% of, uh, or prior to actually 1996, 80% of clubfoot resulted in surgery. And uh, in 2006, only about 15% of clubfoot resulted in surgery. So the whole point of this talk is to understand why that happened. And I think the best way to do that is to utilize Evert Rogers' diffusion of innovation theory. And um, e Evert Rogers was a sociologist at uh, Iowa State University, so I think it's very fitting that uh, the University of Iowa History of Medicine Society has uh, invited me to speak here because this is a very Iowa-centered talk. Um, so he's actually from Carroll, Iowa. Um, and uh, what he described was a model of, for innovation diffusion that uh, basically talks about any invention uh, from the point until it, when it's invented until everybody in the society uses it. And um, to understand that, I like to use this graph that he developed, and I superimpose it with uh, Ponsetti. Um, but this bell curve use, or talks about um, members of society. So 2.5% of society is, uh, are innovators. And um, these are the people that actually create the invention. So this would be Dr. Ponsetti and the people who are doing research on Clubfoot. The next are early adapters. These are the kind of people that um, typically are, they take more risks. They're uh, willing to try new things. And um, so they're the kind of people that are the first ones to catch on to an invention. So when cell phones were developed, they're the ones who walked around with cell phones even though they were kind of bulky and you know, they didn't have great uh, service, but they thought they might be a good idea. The early majority is the next group, and what they do is they watch the people who have tried the invention, and uh, they see how they do with it. And uh, after seeing that, then only they will utilize the invention themselves. Next is the late majority, and they'll only wait until more than half of society is utilizing um, the invention before they'll try it. And lastly are the laggards. I think we all know laggards. These are the people who 
have a VHS player at home, <laughs> and the only way they'll go out and buy a Blu-ray or a DVD is when their VHS player breaks, and then they go to the store looking for a VHS player, and they can't find one because they don't make them anymore. So those are the laggards. Um, and then uh, this S-curve that's kind of superimposed on this image represents the percentage of the population that's uh, utilizing that particular innovation. Rogers talks about some few concepts that are important in order to get from 0 to 100% of a practitioner or um, of the society that's utilize, utilizing innovation, one of which is the innovation itself. Two is the communication channel used. Three is the social system. And, and four is time. Um, now, R.W. Santa Fisher in 2004 described how uh, clinically diffusion of innovation theory is slightly different. So he talks about a few steps that, um, that have to occur clinically in order for a practitioner to, to utilize an innovation. First of all, he has to uh, gain knowledge about that innovation um, by, uh, or, he, or actually first, knowledge has to be obtained by researchers regarding the innovation. Secondly, so that would be Dr. Ponsetti studying Dr. Seinler's technique and realizing that it was imperfect. Uh, two is the individual physician must be persuaded by the advantage of that innovation over their current practice. Um, and, and that would be by reading Dr. Ponsetti's research and realizing that, uh, in fact, this was a very good technique. Um, three is a clinician then independently engages in activities that help them choose whether or not to accept or reject that practice. And this happens in medicine through conferences where they get to speak with local experts and uh, reading medical journals and that sort of thing. Um, number four is the innovation then it must be incorporated into the daily activities of that physician. And lastly, the physician then uh, looks to their peers to um, seek reinforcement of whether or not this innovation is a good idea or not. Medicine is a little bit unique in that uh, I'm actually experiencing this right now as I go through my resident, or I'm going from a medical student to a resident, and as a resident I'll learn from my attending physician uh, who will, it's a very hierarchical structure, and um, <laughs> residents learn from their attendings and they learn their good habits, but they also learn their bad habits. And so this actually, I think, hinders innovation a little bit. Um, and uh, actually, the World Health Organization has described, despite all of the um, medical schools trying to teach evidence-based medicine, there's still a gap between what is known in the literature and uh, what's actually being practiced uh, out in the community. And uh, the World Health Organization calls this the knowledge gap. I think that's a very important concept to understand because I think this, the principles of this talk kind of translate beyond just clubfoot and the Ponsetti method. They, they speak more directly to the knowledge gap. Now, Everett Rogers talks about various factors that are involved in diffusion of innovation theory. The five factors that he mentions are the relative advantage um, of the innovation over the previous innovations, compatibility, is that innovation compatible with what, with uh, orthopedic surgery, um, is it the complexity of it, the trialability, can people try it for themselves, and the observability of the, uh, of the innovation. Now, the Ponsetti method, as I mentioned before, has an enormous relative advantage over the previous method, which was surgery. The Ponsetti method uh, is 95% uh, successful. And um, the previous gold standard of surgery had up to 50% relapse rate. Um, however, despite having a very clear relative advantage, I think the Ponsetti method was uh, hindered by false practitioners. So for a while, the Ponsetti method just represented non-surgical management for clubfoot. So any practitioner who was, who was utilizing casting, not necessarily around the right joint or uh, correctly, um, could claim they were using the Ponsetti method, and they would achieve substandard results. And then when they went out and talked to their peers, I'm using the Ponsetti method, and then they showed their peers their patients, um, the Ponsetti method uh, wasn't shown in, in such a good light. And uh, I think this slowed, or this uh, kind of hindered the advantage of, uh, or the relative advantage that the Ponsetti method had. Next is the compatibility of the Ponsetti method. Now, orthopedic surgeons 
are surgeons, and they like to cut things. Um, the Ponsetti method was a non-surgical method of, uh, of treatment, and so uh, it represented a very clear contrast to what orthopedic surgeons like to do, and also it probably reminded some of them of what Hippocrates uh, developed 2,400 years ago. And so in a time when people were looking for medical innovation in more advanced surgical techniques, uh, more advanced devices, and then there was a guy talking about, well, we don't actually need any of that. We can do it with appropriate casting and then wearing a brace. It wasn't uh, as compatible with what the perception of what an innovation should be. And so that hindered, I think, the Ponsetti method as well. Now, um, uh, speaking to the Ponsetti method's uh, com complexity, um, although it's a fairly complex manipulation that uh, has to be uh, um, typically learned in a very hands-on fashion, um, it wasn't perceived as being technically difficult. In fact, um, one of the advantages of the Ponsetti method is that it can be utilized by people who aren't orthopedic surgeons, so cast technicians and um, other medical providers can practice the Ponsetti method. And that's been especially useful in the developing world where there aren't necessarily orthopedic surgeons everywhere to, to do this. However, uh, the perception of a non-complex innovation, I think, also hindered the Ponsetti method in its diffusion throughout the world. Well, the main advantage that the Ponsetti method had, I think, was its observability. Now, any mother out there, I think any of us, uh, can realize that that's a club foot, or at least that's not a normal foot, and that's a normal foot. And these are the same kid. And um, the Ponsetti method, through serial casting, allows patients and families to, re to directly observe the club foot as it comes out looking like this and slowly gets corrected to look like this. And um, because of that, it's observable by families. It's also observable by, observable by other physicians. Um, anatomically, club foot is described as a midfoot cavus, a forefoot adductus, a hindfoot varus, and a hindfoot equinus. But um, despite, I think, none of us probably having known that in this room prior to me just saying it, we would all know that a, what a club foot looks like uh, because of its observability. Now, the next concept that I'd like to address is communication channels. And um, the what that refers to in Ebert Rogers' theory is uh, th so what they do is they basically directly influence, actually I'll go back to this graph, uh, how we get on that S-curve from when nobody's utilizing the Ponsetti method until everybody's utilizing it. One of the factors that speeds that up is communication channels. And uh, there's two basic forms of communication that Rogers describes, one of which is the macro level. That's mass media campaigns, television, radio, billboards, that sort of thing. And then there's the micro, which describes face-to-face -face communication uh, between like-minded people. Oops. And uh, in medicine, uh, we have medical journals, which are widely distributed to practitioners, typically of uh, uh, different societies. So orthopedic surgeons all typically subscribe to the same medical journals. So other orthopedic surgeons. So this is very macro. and. Um, the micro level is addressed in medical conferences where all orthopedic surgeons meet and uh, they are able to talk to each other uh, face to face. Now, um, the, within the past three years, I've had the opportunity to have each of these places, um, so this speaks to kind of the macro level, um, to either speak or have my work represented in one of these groups. Uh, however, the Ponsetti method, when it was uh, first published in the 1960s by Dr. Ponsetti did not have that advantage. Um, basically because of all the factors I addressed before, it just uh, wasn't perceived as the correct innovation at the time. It didn't have that macro communication channel um, going for it. However, in the late 90s, after the Yahoo-based support group started talking up the Ponsetti method, um, that introduced a new communication channel, the internet, and also uh, parents. And so we had kind of a patient-driven uh, dissemination. And so um, there are five main support groups that each, just between the time of this study done by Marquende 
spoke of, ha, exchanged about 30,000 uh, uh, messages, and a total of uh, almost 800,000 hits occurred at the University of Iowa webpage uh, for Clubfoot from all over the world, 72 different countries and every state within the United States. And um, that certainly expedited the diffusion of the Ponsetti method in the late 90s and early 2000s. Now, once parents started talking about the Ponsetti method, uh, then practitioners started hearing about the Ponsetti method. And they started practicing it. And then uh, they realized that it was actually a high quality innovation. And um, that led to the Ponsetti method being endorsed by several different uh, societies. Uh, throughout the world as the gold standard method to treat clubfoot. Now, a few of these you might have heard of. The World Health Organization, the National Institute of Health, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, and then both the Pediatric Orthopedic Societies of North America and Europe. So uh, on a macro level, the communication channels now are um, were certainly there. And I think that is why in the late 2000s, um, from uh, Actually, the late 2000s when I first described that innovation really taking off until it, this study done in 2012 shows that 97% of orthopedic practitioners now utilize the Ponsetti method within North America. And so um, in the developed world, we really have a great innovation infrastructure that allows once you have an endorsement by societies and it's written in the medical journals, practitioners have no problem accepting a method. Um, and uh, learning how to use it. <coughs> Excuse me. However, that's not the case necessarily in the developing world. And um, there's still areas of the world that are bereft of clubfoot care. Um, and uh, that led to the advent of the, uh, the Ponsetti International Association, which is the University of Iowa nonprofit dedicated to the global eradication of untreated clubfoot. And they do this by. Um, educating uh, Ponsetti method practitioners. And this is Dr. McQuenna, who's my, uh, my research mentor and also the chief medical director of the Ponsetti International Association. Um, PIA has been, uh, initially they started d uh, um, educating practitioners through weekend long workshops. So they take practitioners uh, from the University of Iowa and go to different countries to basically teach these workshops and how to teach other practitioners in other countries how to utilize this method. And um, I, I traveled to my very first research project that I was a part of. Uh, I traveled to Latin America and looked at the use of virtual forums as uh, trying to introduce a new communication channel uh, that would occur after these uh, weekend long workshops. So these, uh, these practitioners abroad could utilize this low bandwidth video conferencing to then ask questions back to Dr. Marquende and the practitioners here at Iowa to see if they could, um, you know, if they had questions they could get them answered. Now this was kind of based in diffusion of innovation theory. Um, I uh, found that it was um, you know, it certainly had some potential, but it, I didn't think we didn't think that it was necessarily the best way, the most efficient way to go about uh, expediting the dissemination of the Ponsetti method. So, if we uh, go back to diffusion of innovation theory and look at what Roger says about this concept, um, he talks about heterophily versus homophily. So, homophily being the degree to which pairs of individuals who interact. Uh, are similar in s with certain attributes such as their belief, education, uh, social status, and the like. So homophiles are really good uh, communicators because they have very similar beliefs, uh, be behavior, attitude, and knowledge. And Rogers says that the perfect uh, diffusion of innovation takes place between two people who are completely alike in every way except for their knowledge of that innovation. And um, I think interestingly, if you look at what we were doing with uh, the weekend long workshops, is we were really using uh, heterophiles, so people who are very different, to try to uh, disseminate the Ponsetti method. So practitioners from the University of Iowa would go abroad and they'd speak in a different language to um, people who worked in different hospitals, saw different patients, and uh, it wasn't necessarily the most theory based uh, way. 
And uh, I think the thing that supports this the most is actually Dr. Ponsetti and Dr. Marquende are both from Spain, and so they speak very fluent Spanish. And uh, we saw expedited diffusion of the Ponsetti method in Latin America, where practitioners speak Spanish. Now, also going back to diffusion innovation theory, Rogers talks about uh, change agents. He describes these change agents as people that are innovative, charismatic, they have many social contacts, they have high socioeconomic status, and they have much social experience and exposure. And uh, he says if you target these people in uh, having them be the ones who spread your innovation, you'll really, um, your innovation will spread a lot faster. And so that led to the train the trainer approach to Ponsetti method dissemination. And um, what that is, is uh, we take uh, practitioners or change agents from abroad and bring them to the University of Iowa where they're able to um, do a few week long fellowship in how to master how to teach the Ponsetti method to their peers at the University of Iowa. Then they go back to their country and they teach the Ponsetti method in their own language with their own social contacts, their own network, uh, their own hospital with their own patients and their own materials. And uh, really the idea behind that being that we're going to teach homophiles to teach other homophiles, people that are very similar. Um, now this idea, since I've been working on it, has received uh, multiple grant support from Ronald McDonald House, USAID, and uh, from the American Medical Student Association. Um, and uh, the, one of the projects I'd like to highlight, this is the first one that I had the opportunity to work with, was with Dr. Mansur Khan, who comes from uh, Pakistan. He worked at, works at Indus Hospital, and he was the first recipient of the American Medical Student Association uh, Pansari Training Fund. Um, and he created uh, Pella, or not created, he actually works for Pella Kadam, which means first step in, uh, in Irdi, which is I speak in Pakistan. And, uh, what you'll see here, so he's been doing this for two years, and uh, he's so far treated about 350 patients uh, in his clinic and um, is continuing to educate practitioners in Pakistan and also um, uh, throughout the rest of the subcontinent. Um, the other project, or sorry, and so this is a little study that he did, and he just asked patients who came to his clinics where they were getting their information about how to, well, how do they find him, basically. And you'll see that most of the people here received uh, you know, their information just from word of mouth. So also speaking to the observability of the Ponsetti method. So when patients, uh, when a parent who has club foot knows another parent who is, whose child had club foot, and they see the club foot, and they see the patient go to the clinic, and then the patient comes back, and they don't have club foot anymore, um, that's really helpful for uh, word of mouth. Um, the other project I'd like to highlight is uh, the Sri Lanka project, which is uh, uh, these two physicians, Dr. Dimithu Tenikon and Dr. Sunil Wijaisinghe, came from Sri Lanka to Iowa uh, to do the Train the Trainer program. And this, they received support from the Ronald McDonald House. And um, they, although they don't have uh, the same statistical study that Dr. Um, Khan did, also, uh, I actually went there six months after they um, completed their fellowship and did a a study in, and they also are, the parent patients there uh, have all heard about these two doctors just from word of mouth. So patients telling other patients, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so in conclusion, uh, I think that, so clubfoot management has come full circle <laughs> from 2400 years ago when this initial treatment was described by Hippocrates. And uh, appropriate understanding of the history of clubfoot, I think, allows us to further uh, understand why the delay or the method was initially delayed in its dissemination. And uh, lastly, if we apply Evert Rogers' diffusion innovation theory uh, to this, we can actually expedite the Ponsetti method dissemination to the place of the world where it's most needed. These are my references. Uh, I'd like, to, all of these people have been instrumental in uh, the work that I've been able to do with the Ponsetti method, but especially Dr. Marquende, who's been um, my research mentor, and he is basically responsible for everything that I've, I've done. I couldn't have done anything without him. Um, these are the different societies or journals that have accepted our work, and uh, each of these um, 
grants or fellowships have supported the uh, work that, that I've done. Um, the Sparks Essay Contest, the uh, Arnold Gold Foundation, Carver College of Medicine Research Fellowship, the Global Engagement Summit, um, the College of Public Health Practicum Fund, and the ECGPS uh, uh, Research Grant. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be very happy to entertain them now. It seems to me that oftentimes there is a tendency for things to be accepted if they sound more technically complex than, than a more simple procedure. Is that addressed at all in the diffusion of innovation? Yeah, I think, I think um, what Rogers would say is that that is kind of the, the compatibility. Like, does this innovation fit? Or is it compatible with what people think the innovation you know, should be? So yeah, I think he, that's, that's what he would say, how it fits in there. Yeah. In, in uh, word of mouth, passing it on, what's the time limit that the parents have to work with? How, how old can a child mm. be to get successful results? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. And um, when I was in Sri Lanka, I saw a uh, 15 year old was the oldest patient that was being treated, um, which is pretty rare. You know, we like to get to the kids you know, right away, but in Sri Lanka there was nobody doing anything with club foot prior to this. Uh, actually that kid had had surgery done, he had relapsed. So um, ideally you want to get kids in. I mean, here we treat them because we find out in ultrasound whether or not they have club foot. We treat them uh, you know, in their first week of life, or st at least start their initial cast after about a week. Um, and uh, so, so ideally right away, but you know, within that first, I'd say, few months, if you ask Dr. Marquende and um, a patient came to him, they'd have no problem. I just to follow up that. It takes five weeks, you said, roughly, when they're young and you're doing this. If mm -hmm. you have someone who's being treated at an older age, say you have a 15 year old, are you still using, taking five weeks, or is this going to now increase the time frame? Yeah, those, those ones do take longer. Those are atypical or complex cases. And uh, very often, they'll have had prior surgery, which makes it a little bit more uh, difficult. So actually, a lot of those cases are referred to the University of Iowa. So Dr. McQuenda actually sees a lot of them uh, because we're one of the centers of excellence for, for this method. And um, the Ponsetti method actually is one of the best ways to treat these people, these kids who've had surgery um, because going back in and recorrecting a surgically flawed foot uh, via surgery isn't, it's just not as effective. You have scar tissue and all sorts of other problems that these kids deal with. But uh, um, the Ponsetti method actually, um, off, he, Dr. McCondor sometimes has to do a, a tendon transfer, but typically he'll just use multiple weeks of casting. And so every patient's different. It's hard to, to answer, um, you know, most take eight weeks or ten weeks, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But he, I haven't heard of anybody going longer than eight weeks of casting under him. Yeah. So, the diffusion of the internet, how is that going to help? That's a, a phenomenal question, actually. I, I wrote an essay on it, and that's a, what got me the uh, New England Journal of Medicine recognition. Um, so internet and I think social media are huge players in medical innovation that I think physicians are apprehensive right now. We haven't fully utilized it. Um, I think because of um, you know what happened with vaccines, there's a, fl uh, a flawed belief that m internet innovation and social media innovation is always going to be wrong. And I don't believe that that's true. I think that parents know what they're talking about, and at the end of the day, they have their kids, you know, in mind when they're talking about this. And so, uh, things that you know help their kids are going to be the ones that really uh, spread through the internet uh, very well. And so, Rogers hasn't addressed it because he he actually passed away in, in 2004, and uh, he. I, I'm not aware of any uh, work that he put out talking about the internet as a communication channel, but I, I don't think anybody would be would say I'm going out on a limb to say that you know, with the ad, with the uh, you know the invention of the internet and and uh, Twitter and Facebook and pe people posting pictures online of disease and asking questions and 
um, that that absolutely facilitates a faster, uh, you know, diffusion of innovation. And I think that um, that what it does actually is it makes it a little bit more patient-centered in terms of the care that we're providing because patients also have access to uh, to um, you know medical knowledge as well. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I I agree. I, I would say that unfortunately, um, some of the uh, well, first of all, it, there's still places in the world that that don't know about the Ponsetti method, and so those places still um, suffer from that stigma. But I'd say that the stigma is something that happens after. That certainly happens after the Ponsetti method has been around for a while, because some of those beliefs are very deeply entrenched you know, culturally, and um, you know I think that certainly having a very effective cure uh, makes it will make it easier to get rid of some of that stigma. Um, but I th but it it's also I guess it's hard to to foresee um, you know how that would. How that would play out, but I think that would come after, after a while, just because of the deep beliefs that are uh, the root of of why that stigma is there. What are the next steps for PIA and dissemination throughout Iowa? Um, so this train the trainer approach is is definitely what you know the kind of has the attention of of the group right now, um, and uh, yeah, I think that. I mean, right now, Dr. Marquende has just a, a list of people that are, uh, you know, uh, apprenticing under him, um, and uh, they have a really, really good model uh, worked out. And I think so. Dr. Marquende has told me that for under twenty million dollars, we could have everybody in the world that needs to know about clubfoot um, know. Which, if you think about that in the context of global health and disease, that's that's t that's a very small amount. So I think there's a lot of passion and a lot of uh, resources right now. Um, other things they're doing is, you know, working on creating a brace that can be, um, you know, uh, mass produced and cheaper and also effective. Um, and uh, yeah, I think um, the ball is certainly rolling in a very positive way right now. When I've been in the developing world, oftentimes in a pediatric uh, or birthing facility. There'll be pictures on the wall. The parents can't help but see that picture and, and I think go to read it. Is there any movement for putting up pictures in, in these facilities to yeah. get the parents to get to somebody? Yeah, I wish I, in Sri Lanka actually, the, um, I, I have a picture of a picture that was uh, in the ward. And it was basically the the five casts of of Dr. Ponce, the picture that I kind of displayed here a few times. Uh, but that's um, one of the I think signature pictures that has been disseminated as well. That Ponce International and uh, different groups have tried to spread. And it basically says clubfoot is curable, and then the pictures. And uh, I think that speaks volumes for this you know word of mouth thing as well. Is uh, um, well, actually, that's that's a different uh, medium, but you know, it, it uh, the observability of the Ponsetti method. So, yeah, I think that's really important. A couple of your slides, you mentioned that eighty percent of this occurs in the developing world. I assume that there's no inherent difference in the individuals; it's just there's more of them, and therefore there's more consequences. Um, the the working hypothesis is that uh, it has to do with maternal nutrition. Um, and so, yeah, I think that um, that's what I've read. And so, yeah, because it it isn't necessarily that eighty percent of people are found in the developing world. There's actually, there's another environmental factor. And clubfoot, like many diseases, is a, is a combination of your genetics and your environment. So, yeah. Nice presentation. As a basic scientist, I think there's clinical application. 
very nicely the principle that you learned in embryology of the plasticity of newborn tissues. Yeah. I was amazed that you could get complete regeneration, but very functional regeneration yeah. to the but uh, ask, are there other clinical conditions that might benefit from this approach as opposed to surgical approaches? For instance, upper limb perhaps, or is this? Um, so actually, earlier this year, uh, New England Journal of Medicine put out a study done by the University of Iowa about the treatment for scoliosis, which is a curvature of the back. And, uh, I think prior to the study, people were doing surgery on scoliosis if it was beyond uh, a certain percentage of curvature. And this study, um, uh, conveniently done out of the same department that has done you know, this work, <laughs> basically said, well, they did a randomized controlled trial, and uh, they uh, braced people. Um, that had you know over 40 percent or whatever that, that percentage is. I can't think of it right now. Uh, correction and found that bracing, in fact, is the way to go for people who have scoliosis. Um, and so you know, I think that uh, I'm not aware of anywhere else that's doing it. But I'm also not uh, an expert in orthopedics or um, uh, anything anymore. But um, <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, so I think that you know there certainly are applications that that it has been used. So I'd, I anticipate that you know that would continue. Yeah, so I'm just curious, you've done all this work and background uh, in what's basically an orthopedic area. So why are you finding one DOT? Yeah, that's that's the question I've had to answer on every single interview I've gone on. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I mean, uh, orthopedics is really uh, an awesome field. But I just like the NT better. So Fair enough. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I wonder, just as you've uh, done some reading and prepared these talks and whatnot, I wonder back uh, when Poinsetti was uh, asked by Steinler mm -hmm. to do this, uh, were the, the writings of his that you had uh, reviewed and gone over to see what uh, excitement he had had, may have had at the time and uh, what insights he had at that uh, period when uh, he was rediscovering? Yeah. I. The only writings that I've read of Dr. Steinler's work were written by Dr. Ponsetti. So I think I have approached that with a certain amount of bias in terms of the excitement that he probably had, uh, because I read it from a point of view of uh, that this method wasn't as effective. And you know, patients were having these poor results. And so um, yeah, I haven't read Dr. Steinler's primary articles on, on his method. Oh, so he was the head of the department at Iowa. Dr. Steinler was prior to. Um, I mean, um, so then Dr. Ponsetti was a junior faculty member, and then Dr. Steinler was like, basically, Dr. Ponsetti, would you look over this technique that I've developed and tell me if it's if it's good? So, yeah. Well, I. One more question. This is really sort of a, a different path. Uh, somebody who didn't know Dr. Ponsetti or, or very, knew very little about him, that would be me, uh, might think from your presentation that his life would have been one of decades of frustration. And finally, fortunately, lived enough long enough to, to see vindication. I imagine it's a lot more complicated than that. Is there a, is there a place one could go to, to, to hear that? Complicated story, or see it? Um, there, I'm. I'm not sure. What I do know is. Uh, oh. His wife wrote. Uh, his wife has a story. Yeah. She wrote uh, the book on him. He also spoke um, about his uh, the Triangle Club. Back at about three, four years ago, and we had that recorded. I think by local Iowa uh, TV. So there are. Things around, and his life is a lot more interesting than just surgery. And he started yeah. out in the Spanish uh, with the Civil War uh, and left from there to try to think. He went to France for money. Yeah, he's a Catalan. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, he had a very interesting life, actually. One of the most, yeah, very gentle. Um, 
One of the things I'd recommend you watching, though, is there's a, a YouTube video of the Children's Miracle Network. They presented him with a, a very large award, um, and uh, he he gave a small speech. It's about uh, I don't know five to ten minutes, and uh, he kind of speaks of his experience uh, um, there and kind of some of the frustration that he had. So I think that might be a place to start. Thank you very much for our for giving our talk, and uh, I'd like to present you with this very heavy book. <laughs> this is the Heirs of Hippocrates, and it's oh. the, the catalog of the John Martin collection. Oh, here. thank you. This and, is awesome. Uh, uh, thank yeah, you. thank you.